Hello, I'm Helen King. I'm Professor Emerita at the Open University. And I want to think with you about traveling inside the body, the history of viewing the body and imagining what's inside. Now, for most of us, we probably don't have much idea about our insides. We know about our outsides, but what's happening inside doesn't really affect us unless we're ill, unless we have pain. We don't think about our heartbeat. We don't listen to our breathing. But all the time, things are happening inside us. Now, unless we undergo the procedures that are available today, like MRIs and X-rays and CT scans, we probably have very little idea of what's actually inside our body. But over time, people have always been interested to know about this. And in the absence of other technologies, they've found ways to think about how their body actually works. They may not have got things right in our terms, but they found explanations which made sense for them. I backtrack about 20 years or so when I was teaching and a student came into my office once to say that she was going to miss my class because her uncle was having one of his livers removed. Now, she was obviously in distress. I wasn't gonna pursue this, but I did wonder whether she actually meant kidneys. We'll never know. But then there is also research around that shows that people in our own society in the UK don't really know what's going on in their bodies. They don't even know how much they've got in terms of organs. They don't know where things are. There's a wonderful study where they asked groups of people passing by in a car park to mark on a model of the body, on a drawing, where particular organs went. And they got them very, very wrong. The one that really defeated them was the spleen. And there is a wonderful video online by some Harvard medical students in 2013 um, on the spleen uh, and in about how much we don't know about it. It includes a fantastic song with a line, if you can live without your spleen, can your spleen live without you? So nobody seems to know outside medical circles about that particular organ, unless of course they've had something wrong with it and had to have it removed. The video by the Harvard students also includes a dancing spleen, which made me think about representing organs individually um, with a life of their own. And we'll come back to that at the end of this video when I think about anatomical votives. Now, back in 1980, I graduated with my bachelor's degree. And one of the most influential things I read in the course of the three years leading up to that was an article by Cecil Hellman, who was an anthropologist, and a GP. It was called Feed a Cold, Starve a Fever, Folk Models of Infection in an English Suburban Community and Their Relation to Medical Treatment. Published in 1978, this article looked at the Feed a Cold, Starve a Fever beliefs and analysed how that's actually a claim about how if you've got a cold, you need to feed yourself up. You've clearly been letting yourself down in some way, behaving stupidly, going out in the cold, not wearing enough scarves. Whereas if you've got a fever, it's due to evil bugs inside you, which are somehow going to attack you and need to be starved. So they'll all die off. Now, the nice thing about Hellman was he did his field work in a suburb of London, very much like where I grew up. So this was not some alien belief. This was what people around me believed. He looked at how GPs actually worked with folk models like this in terms of the way they explain things to their patients. So, for example, saying, yes, you know, you have got this thing, but you need to fast for a few days because that will give the bug nothing to live on, that sort of thing, which isn't obviously strictly true, but it is a helpful way of connecting the folk belief with what the GPs thought. So I found that really, really helpful. Hellman also looked at the changes of season and going from a cold room to a warm room and so on that people thought were dangerous. So he really got into how people thought about their bodies. Also the terminology. So if your symptoms are below the waist, it's a chill. If your symptoms are above the waist, it's more likely to be described as a cold. It was absolutely fascinating to me. He saw the medical encounter as the place where folk beliefs and biomedical models match and meet. So that's where it all happens. So the GP consultation for him was a really important place for constructing medical meaning. 
there's a wonderful drawing from 1913 where we see a common cold germ asking the father of a neurasthenia bacillus if he can marry her. He is refused on account of the social gap between them. So it's very tough being common cold. The idea of bugs actually having a conversation and it's going one step further than the idea that they're somehow colonizing you and needing to be starved into submission. Hellman was also prescient and he saw that patients did not see the difference between bacilli and viruses and bacteria and germs. They were all the same. So that's obviously why people expect a prescription for antibiotics for any bug. They think they're all the same sort of thing. Another article that had a huge impact on me was Vieda Skelton's article of 1970, The Symbolic Significance of Menstruation and the Menopause. Now she did her field work in a village in Wales, a mining village, and she did structured interviews with women and asked them how they felt about their periods. About half of them thought that very heavy bleeding was a really good thing. And they felt, they felt better after one that was really heavy. If they didn't bleed, as much as they thought they should, they were worried. The other group thought that bleeding was weakening them, it was debilitating, and they didn't like it, and they were the ones who looked forward most to menopause. So again, 1970s, the times I grew up, the sorts of places I lived in, 1970s beliefs about feeding a cold and starving a fever, about different attitudes to blood, it made me realize that the beliefs about medicine in our own society and about what's happening in our bodies are actually quite varied and not necessarily what they're supposed to be on a medical model. Actually, if you go online today, the sorts of things that Skelton's looked at are still being discussed. So she looked at the belief that doing something with cold water, like washing your hair or having a bath with cold water would stop your period. And people still ask that question online today. They still think that cold is somehow going to affect their periods. So work like this helped me to think about the past and about how people in the past constructed their models of the body and how they created stories to make sense of their sensations. Now, if we go back to the ancient Greek and Roman worlds, which is where I started my work um, as a student and then as an academic, there's a lot of stuff being done at the moment on votive body parts. The idea of objects made to look like parts of the body which you dedicate to the gods as part of your prayer for healing. Now, healing sanctuaries in the ancient world existed alongside ancient Greek medicine. The time when the Hippocratic texts were being written, the fourth century BC mostly, was also the time when healing sanctuaries were very, very big. They existed before and during and after ancient medicine happened. Some of these votive body parts show things that could be seen as diseased organs. So there's a famous one, for example, which looks a lot like a giant leg with a varicose vein showing on it. Most of them, however, show the normal organ. They show the desired outcome, a healthy limb, for example, or a healthy breast. Others are more mysterious. Now, many have been identified as wombs, and I have an example here made by a rather wonderful supplier who does ancient votive body parts. So here's a womb. These are terracotta. This is the sort of size they would be. Um, and they're found various parts of the Roman world particularly and the Greek world. And this is sort of what they look like. So they tend to have this ribbing on them and they tend to have an opening of some sort at the bottom. And these are usually called votive wombs. Now, if we're going to say that's a womb, on what basis do we do so? Well, it's partly because we assume that infertility would be a problem in the ancient world and that therefore people would be concerned and they take this to religious sanctuaries because there was not much that doctors could do about it. That may be true, but if they are wombs, then what is the ribbing supposed to represent? Is it pain? Is it the idea that somehow these are ripples of pain going through? Is it musculature? Is it the idea that the womb is somehow in control of it, pushing the baby out or pushing out a period that's got stuck, another belief in the ancient world? We honestly don't know. There's a Hippocratic medical text that talks instead about the baby pushing its way out like a chick coming out of a, an egg. So that would suggest that 
uh, medical texts see the baby as active and that religious healing sees the womb as active. Is that pushing it too far when you've only got one ancient text that talks about the baby as the chick coming out of the egg? This is the problem of studying history. There's another possibility, which is that these aren't wombs at all, that they're multi-purpose interior organs, just anything inside. It could be a tummy, it could be a bladder, it could be just a sort of vague sense of insideness. There are also relatively rare, what are called whole body votives, which show the whole body opened up and various organs coming out. How were those made? Were they made from dissection? Or was the knowledge in them based on animal dissection, whether that's deliberate animal dissection for knowledge, or whether it's actually butchery or sacrifice, another context in which bodies of animals were opened and studied. Cecil Hellman wrote about the art of medicine as one involving imagination. Imagining what it feels like to be the person sitting on the other side of the desk, or the person in the hospital bed. In the next videos, I'm going to think more about the roles of dissection and imagination in creating images of the inside of the body over history. These will include Leonardo da Vinci's famous drawing of a man and a woman dissected in the act of intercourse, but also more recent pictures of the body which show it full of miniature people working to carry out the processes of breathing and digestion and so on. So please join me in my journeys into the inside of the body. Thank you.